invasion. And this is exactly the topic that is mentioned okay, inside the email or inside the information you have received on our website. Okay, business model innovation, if I were to find a tech word or a tech phrase, it's basically how to change the rules of the game. And this is actually meant for competitive reasons. So whether you're in sports, whether you're in business, whether you're working for government or organizations, big and small, or countries, big and small, they will have to involve okay, and innovate in order to find the next actually better greenfield ahead or the promised land. Okay? In this webinar, we will be looking at many aspects of the innovation structures, models, and frameworks. Okay, first to demystify, what is innovation? Well, if you look at the word innovation, it's everywhere. Governments use it, companies use it, even actually fast food restaurants use it, or even the neighborhood food store uses the word innovation. Years ago, I hear, and in fact, I've seen with my own eyes, okay, this uh, favorite Long Tao food store near my place. Okay, there was a small little card that was placed near the cashier. Okay, and the, the cashier, near the cashier was this card that says, we innovate every day by bringing you the freshest ingredients across the island. So let set me thinking, okay, uh, if you're going to use such a strong word, such a big buzzword, innovation, will the store owner really understand the meaning behind the word innovation? So I think before we can even deep dive into other aspects of innovation, other subsets of innovation, we ourselves need to understand what is innovation all about. This is one of the most meaningful definitions I've seen so far in many books I've gone through. So if we want to actually put a, a word, okay, to define innovation, okay, we, we can see it from different phases. Many people actually get confused between innovation and invention. These are two different matters altogether. Innovation may not be new. It may not be something that the world has not seen at all. So a lot of people conveniently put that as innovation, okay, but invention and innovation is not the same. Okay, so that's the first disclaimer. Second, viable. What do you mean by the word viable? It has to be value adding. Okay, value adding to who? To people like you and me and consumers. People who consume the product, people who uses the services. And you notice a second part where we are talking about financially sustainable. Here, okay, that I've underlined very quickly in red. Okay, financially sustainable means it must bring value, it must contribute profits back to any businesses. If it's not money making in a short run, okay, you can still struggle to keep afloat. But in the long run, you will choose to exit. So viability is extremely important in innovation. It must be sustainable. That means it must exist for a longer period of a few months. Okay. And new. The word new. So what, what do you mean by the word new? It may not be new to a market, but it may also not be new to an industry. Sometimes innovation, innovative ideas are borrowed and copied from other countries, from other organizations, or even from other actually sources. Okay? For example, it could be a research paper. Okay? Nobody has bothered about this patent, but you decide to do something with it. You decide to create a product. Okay, that entices a lot of consumers to use your offering. So then what is an offering? Offering, a lot of people will think about the products. Okay, the bubble tea that you have consumed last night. Okay, the, actually the services I've used just before COVID-19. But in terms of offering, it's not just products and services. We go behind to look at systems, services, processes, and even business models. So for in definition wise, I hope all of you are with me on the same page. When we talk about innovation subsequently, we are looking at three key things. First, it must be value added. Okay, it must add tremendous value to the people who are using it. It must be money making. Okay, and it may not be new. It's not about invention. It can be copied. It can be borrowed. And finally, we are not talking about products and services as only. We are looking at many other things, processes, customer service, so and so forth. Right? With the definition, we'll start the program proper. This is a book, okay, which has been with me for many years. I use it as a basis when I teach. Um, I like some of the contents, not 
because it's very enriching, but because it's quite simple to apply. Okay, and with that, I come across business model innovation. Okay, four key objectives of business model innovation. These are the four key objectives. Okay, when you are going to use business model innovation, it will be to fulfill any one of these four, or it could be a combination of any four that you see. So when we look at the first objective, to answer, okay, to meet existing unwanted market needs. In many cases, markets, okay, may not understand what they're looking for. Okay, in the case of Tata Motors, which is creating the Tata Nano. Tata Nano is actually the world's cheapest car. It's less than 4,000 US dollars for the entire car. Okay, so people will be wondering, oh, I just spent actually 100,000 buying a Lexus. So why would that be a $4,000 Tata Nano? It's basically because in rural India, or in fact in cosmopolitan India, there's a big group okay, of middle class where they can barely afford luxury brands or even the Japanese brands that you've been using. Okay? Tata came up with this interesting car model where everything is assembled using the basics okay, of what a car should have. So don't expect actually very, very good uh, functions in this car but it's good enough to transport you from place to place. Okay, so here is to meet a existing unanswered market needs. So the middle actually income groups in India, as well as the rural poor, they need transportation. It may not be just a bicycle. It may not be a motorbike, but they need a car. They wanted something better. They need a car with four wheels. So Tata realized that. Tata came in and created the Tata Nano. Okay, Nespresso. Coffee, you could actually get a fix from any of the Starbucks or any of the coffee beans that's around your place. Okay, Nespresso came up with the capsule coffee. Okay, today, a lot of coffee makers, a lot of coffee machine equipment makers all have capsule coffee. But when you look at actually Nespresso, they were the ones, okay, who innovated by bringing the capsule coffee, okay, to every household, every offices. So here, the main objective of Nespresso was to bring technologies, products, and services to the marketplace. The third objective, okay, Nintendo, one of my favorite game consoles. Um, game consoles used to be very complex, okay, especially when it comes to the controllers. You have a lot of functions. Sometimes you don't really even figure out what are the functions for or what are the buttons for. Nintendo actually improved that gaming process. They use very, very simple games, okay, they incorporate into this game console, and with just a swing of your wrist, you can play games as if you're really in the real field. Okay, think about having Nintendo Wii, okay, tennis, it from the comfort of your home. And I think that's getting quite important, especially when some of you could be stuck at home, okay, or probably in a place of your accommodation. So the main objective for Nintendo was to improve something that's there. Okay, game consoles have been around for many, many years, ever since I was young. But Nintendo was the one who took apart the whole gameplay and redesigned, okay, something to disrupt the gaming business. Fourth objective um, is to create an entire new market. Sometimes consumers may not know what they want. They may not even have the slightest clue of what works for them. Okay, it's up to the businesses to create a product that excites them. Okay, Zoom, okay, before this COVID-19, was already being used by some corporations. But within a short window, Zoom has replaced virtually any physical means okay, of meeting up with others. So that is to fulfill an entire new market. And this new market could be scalable very quickly within a short time. So what is really a business model? Okay, Taking a, taking a leaf from the book, we have a business model here. This is actually the bird's eye view okay, of what comprises a business model. You realize that there will be a total of nine boxes. And the idea of a business model is to describe how an organization delivers, creates, and captures value. We are going to deep dive into each of these nine elements, okay, and explain to you a bit more how this is important to the overall gameplay or the game plan. Okay, so we have key activities, value proposition, customer relationships, customers, revenue, channels, key resources, costs, and key partners. Okay, so if we were to look at this, okay, there's nine building blocks. Each of these blocks holds significance important 
okay, towards any business organization or even any uh, country, okay, because a lot of people have this perception, oh, right there, okay, is reflected as business model canvas. So that means I can only apply to businesses. Not exactly. I can apply a business model to even a country as well if I want to. So what's the value proposition that the government has given you throughout this period okay, of nation building? Well, if we actually take a step backwards, we can apply this to NGOs, we can apply this to governments. So for those of you who are working for public sector, okay, it's not just for you, it's also meant for people who are working in the private sector as well. Okay, I'm taking actually Coca-Cola as an example. This is actually some of the ideas that Coca-Cola used to assemble their business model. Okay, parts of it could be developed or could be tailored or customized to suit the country's needs. Okay, but the most important part is you have to keep the ideas going. And all these nine elements will change as time evolves. Okay, first, customer segment. Let's look at customer segment. So who are your customers? Okay, there are two key questions here that we will answer. First, which segment? The world is huge. Singapore is big as well, although we have 5.7 million. But can you cater a product to fulfill everybody's needs? I guess even for telcos, they may not be able to fulfill everybody's needs because every one of us are holding different phones. We have different needs and wants. We subscribe to different plans. Okay, so the first thing, which segment should you serve? Okay, which segments should you cut? Which segments should you just ignore? Okay, we, when we design our business model, we look at customers as a centerpiece because without customers, we are not going to get the profits. Okay, and remember earlier I mentioned about definition, we must make it financially viable. So someone must be willing to give us an opportunity to service them, to meet their needs. So customer segments take the centerpiece of our business model innovation. So examples, these are some of the markets that you could serve. You could serve a mass market, okay, like a supermarket, okay. You could serve a niche market, for example, you cater for people who wear extreme large size clothing. Or you could be looking at multi sided platforms. So later we're going to spend a bit of time looking at what is multi sided platform, all right, and many others as well. Okay, with customers, obviously you want to strike a relationship. You, you want to actually know your customers, you want to know what's on their mind, you want them to keep on coming back to you. Okay, so here we are interested in looking at the types of relationship that you can establish with any customer segments. So there are three ways, okay? Businesses usually use three methods to build the relationship or to establish a form of partnership with the customers. Either they will buy, okay, they acquire new people, okay, new patrons of a offering or a product, or they try to keep you these are existing customers, right? They try to keep you from leaving. They try to keep you away from patronizing other companies or other organizations. Or lastly, they'll try to actually upsell you. They'll sell you something more advanced or more sophisticated than what you're purchasing today. So typically in terms of these three business models, okay, the most expensive is the customer acquisition part. Okay, you spend a lot of good marketing dollars just to acquire new customers. But if you have been in marketing, you realize that actually the later two form of relationships are definitely much more okay, value added. In fact, much more money making as well. Okay, it influences the overall customer experience because your customer relationship will decide the form of interaction, the amount of understanding that you establish with each individual. Five main categories of customer relationship, okay? So you can go for personal assistance, okay? You could go for self-service, automated service, co-creation, and communities. Okay, I will not mention every one that you, every one of it that you see here. I'll probably point at communities. Okay, um, some of you could be using iPhone, right? Okay, so I guess you have a app store. Okay, the idea of an app store, okay, Apple Music was to create communities. Okay, they get you into the ecosystem. But once you're in in the, the ecosystem, whether you're using an iPhone or iPad, okay, it's rather difficult for you to say, okay, I'm not gonna use other Apple products because you have already been incorporated into part of the Apple community. Communities are a very, very strong area to entice, to retain, as well as to capture new audiences. 
So committees are very, very, very commonly used by multi-sided platforms. Okay, so what's actually personal assistance? Personal assistance means I tailor made something for you. I handmade everything. I craft everything just to suit the needs of individuals. Think of um, actually businesses where they spend an extra amount to just make sure that you're well served. This could be the retail shops, okay, any of these apparel shops where they decided to do personalized delivery. Okay, um, now because of COVID-19, Okay, um, so it's quite impossible for all these supermarkets to do delivery, but supermarkets were the first ones to use personalized services. Okay, once you spend a certain amount, say three hundred dollars, and you see, okay, uh, cold storage will say, okay, instead of you hugging everything whole yourself, let me send it to your place. So that's a personalized service. They go the extra amount to make sure that your needs are met. Okay, the third element has to talk about the assets. So what are the key things that you need to create value propositions? Okay, what are the most important resources that you must acquire on hand to make that, to make sure that this business model integrates and works very well? Okay, it allows a business to create a value proposition to go into a new market or to reach a new market or to even serve a new mar uh, current market. It allows you to maintain relationships with customer segments and more importantly, to earn money, revenue. This is actually one of the biggest reasons why businesses are there today. So we need different types of resources. Four main types that you see in any businesses. You will have your human resources, you have your capital, okay, you have your intellectual properties. In this case, it could be patents, it could be R&D, it could be a secret business know-how, or it could even be a secret recipe. Okay, something that belongs to the business and it's quite difficult to be replicated across. Finally, you need a physical space. It could be in the form of a building, it could be in the form of a vehicle, it could be actually even machineries, right? So these four resources must be there, okay? And when they are not there, you can't create a very meaningful value proposition. These are the basic elements to make sure that a business has the means to offer something. Okay, key partners. Key partners are people who work very, very closely with the businesses or with the organization. They are here to make sure that you have the raw materials. They are here to make sure that you have the basic platform of operating any businesses. So here we are looking at the network of suppliers and partners. So suppliers may not be those people who gives you raw materials. Suppliers can be someone who gives you a know-how or they could be someone that gives you an upper hand, okay, in a market. So key reasons why businesses will go for strategic alliances, first, to optimize their business model. Some business models without partners, you are just a one-man island, okay, because nobody is going to work with you, nobody is going to help you to promote or help you to stretch their marketing know-how. So some businesses look at optimization to make the business model more refined to improve the scalability of their business model. Second is to reduce risk, okay? Many businesses today will say, oh, risk is a very important element. Why? Because I want to make a lot of money, but I do not want to incur risk. Unfortunately, in the real world, if you want to make money, it comes with risk and huge risk. So many businesses today have innovated. They say, okay, rather than me thinking about taking all the profits because the risk element is too high, I should think about working with other people, okay, to go into a business venture. Lastly, is to acquire resources. Some resources, we may not have it on hand. In Singapore's case, we need to import, okay, from other countries. In business case, you may need to ask for additional materials or additional know-how or additional support from other organizations. So these are three compelling reasons why businesses, why organizations would choose to work with a complete stranger. Okay, four main types of partnership. Okay, we have strategic alliance, okay, where these two businesses are still separate. They shake hands and say, okay, we should go into something together, but they're still independent. They are not actually merged into one company. They are still two separate independent companies. Each goes about doing their own stuff. But in certain projects, they decided to join hands. Okay, cooperation. 
Okay, it's a very interesting concept of strategy alliance today. In the past, we always say that competitors, okay, we shouldn't be too close to them. We shouldn't um, sit down even on the same discussion table with them because, well, they are out to take away my businesses. They are out to take out my customers. A new concept of business model today has to do with competition. There is two competitors or three competitors coming together and say, okay, we have been fighting war for a long time. Today, let's sit down, okay, and work together to go after the market where the oyster is. Okay, we have the third version, which is a joint venture, and of course, the buyer supply relationship. I would like to focus on the second type, competition, because this is something that is emerging. Gone are the days that competitors will definitely have to fight to the death. In today's modern world, okay, especially in the business community, you see competitors sitting down. And in this COVID situation, I see a lot of competitors that's working together for the common good of society. For example, MERS and GSK, okay, two pharmaceutical companies. They decided to collaborate. They want to put their research resources together to develop vaccines okay, for the COVID-19 situation. Okay, so they are going to pull their engineers, their scientists, okay, or whatever patents they have. Together, they are going to develop, okay, hopefully a cure for this COVID-19 situation. So two pharmaceutical companies that used to fight against each other, now they are working together. Um, another example of competition happens yesterday. I was reading the news this morning, and I realized that M1 and Starhub, they have just set up a joint collaboration to develop Singapore's 5G network. Aren't Starhub and Singtel supposed to be competitors? So why are they coming together? Why are they pulling their resources together to work together? Because 5G network is the reward, okay? And because the reward is so enticing, they decided to separate their differences, put aside their differences, and work together, okay? To develop something meaningful for us. Okay, key activities, I was talking about this earlier. These are basically the things that you have to do okay, on a day-to-day -day basis. Otherwise, your business model will just fall through the cracks. It will just collapse overnight. So you can look at things that have to do with creation or value proposition. Marketing, okay, how you're reaching the market, how are you advertising your products, how are you establishing the awareness, okay? how are you building your relationship with your customers, okay? or how are you trying to earn more for the organization. So the most important actions that any businesses must adopt today is to result in any of these four actions. Okay. Otherwise, your key activities has very little meaning and very little value added okay, to the success of your future organizations. Okay. These are three activities. Okay. Um, these three activities itself, production, problem solving, and platform network are what we call value propositions, okay? These value propositions, how you're gonna make money, what are key objectives that people are looking for, it has to do with each one of these three, or it could be a combination of any of these three. Problem solving, very frequently being used by consultancies, okay? Very frequently used by R&D, research and development units. Platform, okay? Anything that involves the role of a middleman, and later we're gonna look at that in totality. Production, Okay, when I create new products or new services just to meet the needs of the consumer markets. Revenue stream. Okay, this should be shouldn't be too alien okay, to a lot of you who are managing departments or managing uh, finance or accounting teams. Okay, revenue streams basically we are looking at the sources of money, the sources of revenue. Without revenue, the whole business model has no meaning, it has no end game. We need to find areas to make money, okay? And each of these revenue stream will adopt different pricing mechanisms, okay? The pricing mechanisms that we see here will not be elaborated in totality, okay? Because I have limited time, okay? I cannot zoom into the, some of the different pricing techniques that different businesses have used. But if you are with me for the next webinar, okay? That means next uh, Thursday, I will zoom into the business model invasion further by sharing with you the price model strategies, okay, that companies have used. Okay, two types of revenue, okay. We are looking at re transactional revenues. These are usually one time, okay. That means I give you something, you give me the cash, okay. End of relationship. 
So it's very transactional. There is no follow up after the money has exchanged hands. Okay, second, recurring. That means every other given period of time, I'll be charging a certain amount and this will go on perpetually until you decide to say, stop, I'm not willing to pay you anymore. So these are two key sources of revenue, okay, that contributes to the profitability of any businesses. So I would like you to walk away, okay, with seven types of creating money streams, okay, or revenue streams. These are the seven types, okay. Asset, sale, you can sell away something that's of value to people, okay. It can be a car, it can be a product, it can be a service, something that's of value. You just sell it away, you get cash in return. You could go into advertising. Instead of me selling something, let me promote something for you. Let me increase the awareness on your behalf. Okay. Um, brokerage fees, I am the middleman. I will earn the in-between. Okay. I put two groups of buyers together. Okay. I facilitate the interaction between them. And I will earn my kit. Okay. Just because I help to connect both of you. Instead of you selling the whole thing away, you could list you could lease it out, you could rent it out, okay? Um, the product or the item, the asset is still yours, but you're just giving away to let people use it for a limited time. Okay, licensing, this has to do with intellectual properties. Instead of me saying, okay, the product belongs to you, I'm giving you the rights to use images. This is frequently used in the creativity industry as well as the gaming industry. Okay, I allow you to use certain characters. I allow you to use certain trademarks or even my logos, but the, on condition that you pay me royalty or you pay me a part of your profits okay, every year. So licensing is becoming very, very popular, especially in the creative industry. Okay. Subscription fees. Okay. I allow you to use my product, okay, but you must pay me a fixed amount every month or every year. Okay. I will not put a cap to how much you're using. You just pay me the money. Okay as promised, and you can use whatever you want from my system or from my product. Finally, usage. I charge you based on the amount that you use. The more you use, the more I charge. The less you use, the less you pay. So these are seven key ways that you see okay, where businesses try to go about earning their kit, okay, to generate some form of returns for their investment. Channels, okay, how do we actually communicate with our customers, how do we make sure that the product is made available in the marketplace? We communicate, we distribute, we use sales channels, okay? And these are your touch points, your customer facing touch points. Each of these touch points are extremely important. And to manage each one of them carefully, it will result in a lot of meaningful returns to your investment, okay? We are looking at the customer experience and the customer experience here will be very important because without customer experience, okay, there is definitely no happy customers. And without happy customers, you are not going to be able to achieve your sales target or your revenue target. Okay, so organizations, you can choose between three options. Okay, first, you can develop your own. In this case, you can hire your own salespeople. You could open up your own retail front. You could actually have your own distribution line, okay, or your distribution network. Or you can work with other people. Instead of you doing all the work yourself, I work with third parties. I work with someone in return for a fee. Okay. Um, in a lot of career businesses today, okay, I don't think you need to maintain a career guide. You can always go to career companies and say, okay, I would like you to deliver a parcel. That is through a partner channel. Or you could use a combination of both. Okay. You can actually lump them together and to create something that's hybrid. So we are looking at value proposition. So what's value proposition? The uniqueness of your businesses, your unique selling point of your product. So why would, a, why would consumers choose you? Why not others? Why must they choose you? This is actually the question that's been on the mind of a lot of businesses. How do I entice customers to part with their money? Here, we are looking at a bundle of services that create value. So what do you mean by create value? The word value itself is a Big, big. We are going to demystify some of this value creation. Okay. When we talk about creation of value, we are talking about the emergence of a new market. We are talking about solving a customer need or a customer problem. Okay. And to make them actually happier. 
And in return, they'll be more than willing to part with their source of money. Okay. So 10 reasons why businesses would choose one over another. Okay. It could be because some products are very new. You've never heard about it. You like the novelty. Okay. You like to be the first person. Okay. For a lot of techies, I'm sure you can't wait to lay your hands. Okay. On the latest iPhone model. Okay. You queue up overnight. Okay. Just because nobody else have it in the world. It could be because of status by having something. Okay. It elevates your status or your society standing. Okay. Um, others, it could be actually going for by virtue because of price. Okay, it could be because it's free, or it could be because it's very affordable. And accessibility, or it could be because of design. You choose something because you like the aesthetics appeal. Okay, you have easy access to something. So these are the 10 key reasons why customers will choose one company over another. Okay, in very successful businesses, they will not use just one reason. You'll use a combination of reasons. Okay, here because of time, I will not be able to deep dive into every single thing. Okay, but this will be covered in greater details during my next webinar when we are talking about business, we are talking about pricing model innovation. Okay, cost structure. Every businesses will incur costs. Okay, whether is it to pay your staff, whether is it to buy raw materials, or whether is it to transport something from place to place. Okay, some business models are more cost intensive versus others. So here we need to actually break down, okay, cost structures. There are two types of cost structures. One, cost driven, okay. That means you are trying to keep the lowest cost as possible. The lower the cost, the better it is for your business. Okay, these are usually for businesses or industries where price margins are not high. Okay, the in-betweens, the margins that they earn are very minimal or very minimum. Okay, the second type of cost structures are talking about value driven. That means I don't mind about cost, okay. Uh, my main objective is to give you the value, extremely value, okay, extreme value, so that you're willing to pay me more okay, than what my cost is. So when it comes to cost driven, we are looking at minimizing costs. We want to make it as low as possible. If possible, the lowest in the industry. It's really challenging, right? Because you have to leave no stones unturned. Look at every single aspect, even paper. If you can cut down the usage of paper or stationery, you do that. Okay, that's a cost driven model. Value driven model. Focus on solving needs, okay, fulfilling un unknown ones. Okay, and this value innovation that is a success story behind a lot of unicorn businesses today. Okay, and that is something that we aspire to achieve. For value innovation, um, it will be mentioned in my third webinar, two weeks from now. Okay, where we're gonna deep dive once again, we are gonna um deconstruct, okay, we are going to actually um disseminate okay business models. We are going to look at some business businesses look at different aspects of what they've been doing to result in certain value for their customers. Okay, I've just quickly go through the nine models, okay, the nine elements of a business model. Each one of these will have to be integrated. In other words, we can't be looking at the product offer without looking at the effectiveness of the channels. We can't be looking at channels without knowing what key partners we are working with or what clients are we serving. So these nine elements, nine boxes, will have to be integrated and assembled to provide you with a bird's eye view. Okay, five patterns okay, that I can share with you. And these five patterns are right in your face. Okay, you see it every day. Uh, later, you're going to realize that it's very, very common. Okay, it's literally around you. So first pattern, okay, we are trying to unbundle business models. Essentially, in this pattern, there are three types of different businesses. One, a customer-centric business where they work very much on relationship. Second type, works on product. Oh, I sell you something. Okay, I sell you something tangible. Okay, I sell you a service. You will know that you have received this when you have consumed that product or that service. The third is infrastructure. I'm building a platform. I'm building a system. Okay, these three fundamentally different type of businesses can be found in one organization. Okay. And it's not every organization, but yes, there are businesses where they have all three built as part of their gameplay. So each business type will have its own economic, its own cooperative or cultural dimension. Okay. The purpose of this webinar is not to examine each one of this. Okay. But you have to understand that 
every one of this type would have its own actually rules of game. Okay, so we are obviously interested to know a bit more as we dissect each business model. Okay, so earlier I mentioned all three types can exist in one single corporation. And ideally, the way to look at this business model is to dissect, okay, all three, okay, and then you separate each one of the businesses and look at what matters, what makes it work. Okay, using business model, this is business type one. Okay, where you are very focused on customer service. Okay, you want to make sure that your businesses okay have a very strong rapport with your customer to the extent that they become the most loyal customers ever. Okay, this is where relationships matter a lot. So to look at actually a customer-centric business model, these are the elements okay of a business model that you need to focus on. In essence, the gist of it. Second, for product-oriented okay, businesses, they will have to look at areas like, for example, the offering, what segments they're offering to the market, which are the clients that are serving. They have to look at the employer's capability as well. And in return, they are able to charge a higher price because of the product, creativity of the product. Third will be the infrastructure, the systems. Instead of me selling you a product, instead of me actually talking about serving my customers, I could sell you a platform. I could sell you an infrastructure. And from that infrastructure, I could resell it to my competitors. Okay, I could actually look at developers who may use this system or this actually particular uh, resource. So in an abundant business model, okay, when you look at the whole gameplay of the business model, it's very complicated. But if you were to dissect this by business type, it becomes extremely clear, okay? So three types of business, okay, exist in this single corporation. So some good examples. Anyone who holds a telco subscription line, Singtel. Okay, so people will be asking, oh, Singtel, isn't that a B to C business model? Because I use a lot of Singtel lines, okay? But I don't see where the, actually the elements of the other business types are. Okay, to B2C, yes, you could be a retail consumer. That is the first type where they focus on your relationship. They want to build a strong relationship with you. They don't want you to leave okay, the infrastructure. Okay, they don't want you to go for Starhub or M1. So in order to do that, they must use the business model in orange. The second business type is meant to serve corporate customers, institutional customers. Okay. In institutional customers, they must look at how they're appealing. Okay. How are they different versus other corporate providers? And the third type, that's not very obvious. Um, some of you may be aware that Singtel provides a system and they resell their, uh, their, actually their broadband okay, or their telco networks to other telcos. Okay. For example, the 5G networks okay, they are looking at may not be sold to people just like Starhub or M1. They can be selling to other third parties, okay, or other countries, okay, telecom provider. So in the third type, okay, is something that businesses don't see, is something that consumers don't see, but it exists between institution to institution. So it's usually below the surface, okay. But you can see that in Singtel or any major telcos, right? And that's the reason why it's very complicated. If you want to dissect Singtel, you can, but you have to use the methods of looking at each individual business type. Another example, DBS, okay, one of the most important essential services. Okay, DBS itself serves B2C, okay, retail customers like us. They serve businesses, they serve corporations. Okay, but do you guys know that DBS have a DBS Academy that trains a lot of fintech talents? They are into training as well. They are not no longer just a bank. They will serve other banks by inviting other bank personnel to go to DBS Academy to attend classes in return for a fee. That is the third business type that I'm mentioning. Okay, so this is actually something very, very common. Okay, usually found in MNCs, okay, or in the larger local businesses. The second type, okay, is what we call the long tail. Okay, the long tail terminology is borrowed from Chris Anderson. 
Okay, Chris Anderson in the 1980s wrote a book called The Long Tail. So what's a long tail? Okay, if you look at long tail, it derives its name from this. Okay, you see the orange, okay, machats. Okay, this forms the tail. Okay, so you will have some products at the front, okay, where it contributes a big portion of your sales. Okay, they're selling extremely well. And then you have a variety of other goods which are not selling as much in terms of volume and they're contributing less profits, but you have many, many of them. Okay, in total, you will say the businesses averages out, okay, to derive a certain level of profitability. So in this business model pattern, we need, okay, to have very low inventory costs. We need to have a very strong platform and to make sure that niche contents or niche offerings are available, okay, to interested buyers. Okay. Business model, okay. These are the business models that holds a lot of importance to them. Okay, first, they will have to look at business offering. Okay, they will serve clients, okay, especially niche clients. They can use internet, okay. They will also have a common platform. In this case, platform may not be something that's web-based. It can be something that's physical as well. Okay, they will need to maintain. To them, key activities are really important because this is actually the platform, but they will have to maintain this platform to make it usable, to make it appealing. Okay, and finally, a lot of that cost goes towards platform maintenance and development. So the idea of actually long tail is that I will sell less of more. What do you mean I sell less of more? Okay, basically, I'm selling a lot less, right, in terms of volume. Okay, you realize that each of these orange boxes, I'm not selling as much as the blue or blue uh, bar charts, but because there are many, many of them, so together, collectively, they contribute quite a significant portion, okay, to the profitability of a business. So, example, Netflix. Some of you, uh, are they listening to Stanley? <laughs> okay, after this, you probably will be dying for the next episode, okay of Netflix series. Netflix captures this extremely well. They use this, the long tail. Okay, they have a lot of niche contents. Some contents that I can't even remember or understand why they're there. But because they're there, I think Netflix is a good way for me to get around the boredom okay, at home. And it's also one of the best ways where it appeals to different people with different needs. Okay, you realize that Netflix has thousands and thousands of shows okay, available on demand. But how many of you watches every episode? Not really, right? So why do you choose Netflix? Why don't you go for StarHub? Why don't you go for actually Singtel Mio TVs? Oh, because Netflix gives you a flexibility. Netflix offers so much contents, okay? It's given to you upfront with one subscription and you can decide, okay, which you want to consume. So in Netflix, they know, okay, which other blockbuster series. True, the blockbuster series will be the ones that you see in blue, okay? Those that are not as popular, maybe because they are soap operas or maybe because they are artistic shows, they contribute the other part of the business model, the orange part. Okay, so Netflix captures and leverages on the long tail. Another example. Well, this morning before I talk to you guys, I I made a very quick trip. Okay, to NTUC. Um, I mean before COVID nineteen, this is the scene that you get. Okay. After COVID-19, uh, some of the shelves could be missing items, <laughs> okay? Uh, this morning, when I went to the NTUC, that price name my place, I was shocked to see um, certain brands of instant noodles literally wiped out, okay? So that is not the case of our discussion here. Okay, what I'm trying to share with you is that the supermarkets, okay, uses the long tail business model. They will stock up thousands and thousands of different products, different brands, okay, different categories. Mm -hmm of household appliances or whatsoever, or even household items. So when you go to a supermarket, are you buying everything off the shelf? No, you're only going for the essentials or the staples. Okay, so staples, in this case, rice, sugar, um, well, even um, things like, for example, meat, vegetables, these are the blue boxes. They account for a huge volume, okay, of the business. But when you go to a supermarket, you will not just buy these two items. You'll buy others, right? You may grab the fruit juice, you may grab some biscuits to go along. Those accounts for the blue boxes, uh, the orange boxes. So you buy less of those. But when you go to the supermarket, 
what entice you to go to the supermarket is because they stock up everything. Okay, they were adopting their long tail. Oh, you were afraid that if I miss up something, I will use okay that opportunity okay to buy something just in case it slipped my mind. So long tail has been known for a long time, and usually, in companies that's using long tail, they stock up thousands and thousands okay of similar products or different products just to entice you to give them an opportunity to patronize them. Okay, the third type okay um. Very, very common once again, multi-sided platform. When we say multi-sided platform, we are looking at two things. Okay, we are looking at two different groups or three different groups or even five different groups. And each of these groups are interdependent. That means they don't need to depend on each other. They are very, very different. Okay, their needs are different. Their wants are very different. Okay, or even how to go to them, how to appeal to them. They could be looking for different things. For this business model to stand, it must be two different groups. And... To keep these two separate groups aside, you must serve as a middleman. Okay, you have to perform the role, okay, of the facilitator or the networker. Okay. So in this business model, one group is only of value if the other group, the other side of the other group, is available or is present. So it's like a um, actually a balancing beam. Okay. If I want to appeal to this side of the audience, okay, who is quite different, I need another audience. Okay, on the other side, and they should be ideally balanced. Okay, and in between when interact, I'm right in the middle. That's where I'm earning my keep. That's where I'm earning my commission. Okay, multi seller platform today are very, very common. Whatever apps that you see, okay, in your phone, in your smartphone, in your iPads, chances are very high, these are multi seller platforms. So later, we're going to go behind the scene, look at what matters to a multi seller platform. Okay, they facilitate value. They act as a middleman. Okay, people have been telling me, oh, you know, middleman, they are dead. Well, the middleman has evolved. The middlemen are using technology today. They are developing systems. They are developing networks. They are developing platforms. Okay, so that you no longer perceive them as middlemen. Okay, they are your modern middlemen, per se. Okay, so these are some of the examples that you see. You have Uber, MasterCard, Microsoft. Your PayPal, Apple, Visa, these are all your very common multi seller platforms. Okay, how they go in value? Okay, they become very popular because of the network effect. So, what's the network effect? Earlier I mentioned, in order for me to earn my kit, okay, I must have two equal groups of different customers, okay, each of them with different needs. The more they are, okay, on either side, the bigger my network effect will be. So, in multi seller platform, they focus a lot on building subscription bases, on building membership. Okay. If we are going to look at the business model behind multi seller platform, okay, the first thing that I focus on is build that platform, to build that infrastructure, to build that system. And this platform should be the only way how two different types of businesses or different customers are going to interact. That means whatever you do, I don't care what you do. Okay, you want to make sure a transaction happen, you have to go through me. I am the gatekeeper. Okay, I have the right to stop you, okay, from connecting with the other side, okay, of my business model. So they spend a lot of time, okay, to beautify, to redesign, to, to simplify, okay, this system. So they spend lots of money in terms of R&D first, but it's one time because it's scalable. It's extremely scalable once you have the, the other customers coming in. So First, they look at customer segment number one, okay, value proposition. They have to uh, give this customer group a reason. What can they do to make their life easier? What can they serve okay, to these customers? What can they help? Okay, how they can help to make sure that these customer needs are fulfilled or these problems are solved. So they will tell you, okay, I have a unique value proposition for you. Because of that, you should give me part of your money. Okay, so that will result in revenue flow number one. Okay, to the other side, okay, of the business groups, okay, which is different from the first customer segment, they will design a separate value proposition and say, okay, this is how we are going to help you. Okay, this is how we are going to connect you to customer group one. Okay, and in between, because I'm helping you to do the dirty work or I'm helping you to do a lot of extra efforts, pay me. Okay, I would demand for a portion of your earnings. So, and from there, they earn the revenue number two. 
three, okay, they may appeal to more than just two groups. They may appeal to three groups, five groups. Okay, it doesn't matter. Here, once again, they design. Okay, they want to figure out who's the third customer segment. They will redesign another completely different value proposition. Okay, to result in a revenue flow. And in the process of doing that, okay, to build up the, the network effect, okay, they will always try to give you free subscription. They'll give you a trial period. They'll tell you, oh, you can download my app free, you know, you don't need to pay a single cent. And guess what? In order for me to reward you, let me give you some subsidies. Okay, I'll give you some special offers. That's to entice you, okay, to build up your familiarity, your adoption of the platform. But the end game is not there. The end game is that they want you to be stuck in this ecosystem. Grab, okay. Uh, a lot of us are ordering food from home, okay. Grab food, extremely common, okay. Uh, if you have been working, if you're part of the essential service, maybe you need to go to office still. Okay, you will use Grab transport or Grab car or Grab taxi, okay. Whichever mechanisms you use, you realize that you're using one single app, okay. Today, Grab has evolved a lot. They could even allow you to book at uh, movie tickets. They allow you to book hotels. Um, in some countries itself, other competitors of Grab ha have even evolved where they allow you to do deliveries, parcel deliveries. Um, in Philippines, interestingly, um, if you look at Grab, okay, uh, how many of you are aware that they allow you to book a chopper? In this case, a helicopter ride, okay, to get around the needs to travel in the car. Okay, it's only available in Philippines. Okay, so Grab has evolved completely out of what you have been thinking of. In Asia, yes, if you look at Grab, it's just an app, nothing else, nothing fantastic, nothing fanciful. It's simple, very easy to use. Just put your credit card details in. You can do whatever you want by ordering a certain service or a certain product. But in different countries, Grab would have to constantly evolve to take in consideration different customer needs. So Grab uses multi-sided platform. So a lot of people have been asking me as I was teaching, okay, um, Stan, you always like to use Grab as an example. So how does Grab earn its money? Well, just to, for illustration purposes, okay, let's use Grab car or Grab taxi for, for ease of illustration. Okay, to the taxi drivers or to the Grab car drivers, what did Grab say? Grab says, okay, let me help you to find customers. You no longer do you need to make a lot of rounds, okay, across the whole island, hoping for a customer to flag down your car or your taxi, okay? I know who are the customers. I know where they are around the island. Let me help you to connect, okay, with them. But for me to connect you with them, I will charge you 60 cents per booking, okay? I would also want 20% of that fare that the customers is paying you. So to the taxi drivers, to the Grab car drivers, that's how they are required, okay, to pay to Grab. So Grab earns first, first cut, right? So to the other side of the equation, okay, this will be the passengers, okay, who decides to use Grab to book a taxi. So when you book a taxi, okay, uh, or a private car through Grab, you are going to pay booking fee, okay? And this booking fee itself is not a lot, but you realize that it searches, especially when the demand is high. So as it searches itself, remember the fare that you pay, 20% of this extra fare you pay, doesn't go, okay, to the driver. This 20% goes to Grab. So you realize Grab being very smart, I'm middleman, okay? I service two different groups of people. In between, I don't care which group you belong to. The moment you're using my platform, give me my money, okay? The other group, once they use the same platform, give me money again. So that's how Grab has been making its profits, okay, over time. Okay, this should be something that is very familiar especially to people who are in the corporate world, LinkedIn. So a lot of people say, you know, LinkedIn is free. Yes, I agree, of course. But you only see one side of the equation. Okay, for people like me, for people like you, who have some form of corporate exposure, yes, you can just register for an account. Okay, you don't need to pay a single cent. But what happens on LinkedIn? Do they need still to maintain their platforms? They need to maintain their platforms. So how are they going to earn their revenue? They earn their revenue from advertising. So who are the advertising? Okay, it will be corporations who want to promote or want to increase awareness of a product. Okay, LinkedIn will earn a cut. And one thing that a lot of people doesn't really know, LinkedIn will also charge, okay, 
businesses or developers that wants to use their platform, okay, for incorporation of certain ecosystems. So to us end users, yes, we are free, okay, we don't pay a single cent, but to other businesses, to other corporations, they will have to pay. So in a multi-seller platform, some businesses may pay to substitute, okay, or to subsidize other people who are using, okay. Some businesses will captivate on, on the middle main status by charging both. Okay, so LinkedIn is actually one of the very common business models for multi sided platform. Okay, number four, okay, it's about freemium model. Freemium model, as the word suggests, it comes from the word free. Okay, um, people have been saying there's no free lunch in this world. I agree absolutely because in freemium model, that's a basis of the proposition. Okay, in, in freemium model, you must have one customer group who is able to benefit okay, from other people who's paying for, for a better service. You have different patterns to make sure that the free offer is possible. Okay, and I mentioned this, okay, although you're not paying, you're enjoying the free product, someone else is paying. And because that someone else is paying, that is how freemium model makes its revenue. Okay, so whether you are actually the, the belonging to the box on the left or you're belonging to the box on the right, okay, you are very important elements to make sure that the freemium model works. So when you look at freemium model, first you provide a very basic service. Okay, you can look at your Gmails, you can look at, at your Dropbox. These are all given to you free. You don't need to pay a single cent. And because it's free, they will have a large base of users. Okay, you don't need to pay any single thing. But for those who want to have a bigger Dropbox capacity, for people who want to have better services, you have to end up paying more Okay, by paying a money subscription, okay, that is when the pre premium model comes in. So in a premium model, people who are paying, okay, subsidizes the people who are not paying. Okay, and the most important part of a premium model has to do with your development of your infrastructures. Okay, and ideally in a premium model, the objective is to keep the cost as low as possible or to make it fixed so that it doesn't change, it doesn't deviate. That way, you can scale up very quickly at reduced cost. Okay, Zoom, well, we're using this mechanism. To many of you who are not paying, okay, um, it's free. You can use 45 minutes anytime, no questions asked. Okay, you are, don't, you are not even required to provide a credit card. But for companies, for corporations, for people who are required okay, to present to large audiences, they probably will have to go for a paid subscription account. Okay, so people who are paying subsidizes people who are not paying. So Zoom is a good example. Spotify, if you love music, okay, there are people who don't believe in paying $10. I'm one of them. I don't believe in paying $10 for music because I have YouTube, right? I have so many other ways like MP3, files, whatsoever. So once, when must I pay Spotify? To people who believe in Spotify, they don't mind paying $10. But to people who, like me who don't believe, okay, it's all right. I can survive. Okay, I just have the basic essentials of what they offer me. If I can skip songs, it's okay. I, I'm not hard for it. I can always turn to YouTube or other ways okay, to fulfill my musical needs. Okay, pattern five, open business models. Okay, this is actually something that's emerging uh, very quickly. Okay, uh, a bit abstract for people who are not very exposed. Business model, open business model, leverages on the community. Okay. And it, in this business pattern, we create value by collaborating with other people outside of the organization. Remember, these are strangers. These are people that you probably don't have relationship at all, okay, throughout the whole history of your corporation. To construct this, there are two methods. One is look from outside in, okay, where we explore ideas, okay, ideas given by your customers, ideas given by your suppliers, ideas given by someone who doesn't even know you, okay. This is outside in. I bring an idea from outside, okay? I bring it into my business model, into my organization. I capitalize on that. The second type is I will look at something internally, okay? Develop it well before I export it out, okay? To the market. So pattern one, okay? Pattern A. Okay, when you're going for outside in, that means I'm trying to leverage on what are the knowledge, what are the contents available outside. Okay, I will look at actually universities, I'll look at research bodies, I'll look at governments, I'll try to look for ideas. Okay, I will develop some activities like doing research, 
okay, screening for ideas, looking at secondary markets that's not served, okay, and also looking at externalizing. Okay, that means in other words, if this is coming free, it's good. Okay, if it's not free, I'm not interested. So I bring all these ideas, okay, into that organization. Okay, the interesting thing about this business model, those boxes on the left side means they are more external facing. Those boxes on the right, okay, from this line, okay, are internal. Okay, the one in the middle is why you are there. Why are you surviving? Why is your business still actually working today? So an example of outside in, okay, will be crowdfunding, crowdsourcing. Okay, Kickstarter, okay, um, uses a lot of ideas, okay, from people like you and me, individuals who wanted to start business. We have very, very brilliant ideas. Unfortunately, we don't have the capital. Or in other words, in samples context, uh, we use the terminology, uh, kiasi, you're scared of failure. You don't want to put your own money to try something. So Kickstarter is a platform that allows you to pitch your business ideas, okay? Describe your business ideas, describe the product, okay, that you're trying to serve or the customer space that you're trying to serve. And this goes out to the community, the investment community, small-time individual investors. Okay, if they like it, they'll pledge a certain amount of donations towards your business idea. Okay, and once you meet a certain target, the project goes live. That means you'll get all the money that was pledged okay, to start a business. So Kickstarter started from the United States. Okay, it has been extremely successful. It's one of the biggest ecosystems for venture capitalists, for small-time investors, or for people who just want to have a tr first try in starting a new brand new business. So the idea of Kickstarter was very simple. Okay, I am not here to decide whether it should you succeed. Okay, I'm here to invite people to put wonderful business ideas to my system. And through my system, my platform, I promote to other investors who could be looking for small little returns okay, on different business aspects. So from there, you will earn your actually revenue. And that's how Kickstarter earns their money as well. Okay, um, some of you who are Singaporeans recently have received a $600 from the government, right? Okay. Uh, well, because I mute you, obviously you can answer me. Okay, but some of you could have received a six hundred dollars from the government. Okay, um, some of you who could be a better, a lot better wealth off, or you're a bit more concerned about the social impact that this COVID situation has, you may decide to donate your money. Okay, back to the communities, to the charities. Okay, um, this platform, Giving SG, okay, just received a record six point nine million dollars donation, all thanks to people like you. And giving dot as she was just using a very simple business model. It's open innovation outside in. Okay, you have money that you don't want to use. Sure, give it to me. Pass it to me. I'm the platform. I'll collect on behalf of all these charities and beneficiaries. Okay, and return I'll pass you. I'll pass them their key. So does giving dot as she collect certain portion? Well, that's something that's for them to know. Okay, um, it's not the purpose of our discussion here, but. We are interested to know how this platform adopts one of the most cutting edge business models. Okay, and that's outside in. Okay, for inside out, that means I develop something internally first. I have a spin off, usually a intrapreneur unit. Okay, the Masik Holdings has one. Okay, it's called Sing Singbridge. Okay, Singtel has one. It's called Inno8. So Inno8 is separate from the Singtel Corporation. The main purpose of Inno8 as a separate business unit is to look at ideas that the group generate and then to take some of these wonderful ideas to monetize, to develop new products or new systems. So they are thinking like a subsidiary. But this subsidiary, right, leverages on its parent. Okay, they look at a lot of unused patents, a lot of ideas, and together they try to look for new markets. They sell off these businesses. Okay, or they could actually license it off or spin off. That means they created multiple subsidiaries after that. Okay, in in Singapore, okay, I'm sure you heard of this new company, Dyson, which recently announced that they're going to shift their headquarters to Singapore and they're going to expand the production. Okay, this is a backless vacuum cleaner. Okay, how long did it take actually the founder of Dyson okay, to invent the first backless vacuum cleaner? It took him 560 tries, laps in the labs, before he created something that's usable. It's not what you see on the screen today. Okay, it's not as nice as this, but it was workable. Okay, it doesn't have a bag. Okay, not like the traditional vacuum cleaners, they have a bag. 
this one doesn't have a back and we, it also doesn't have a very long electrical cord. Okay, it's actually literally uh, mobile. Anywhere you can use around the house. So Dyson, okay, corporation was using the idea of inside out. I look at something internally in my labs first. Okay, once it's something viable, I bring it up to the market. I develop that for the market to decide whether is it usable, whether do they want to pay me. Okay, uh, this is an autonomous bus, okay, which is developed by NTU, LTA, and Volvo. Okay, autonomous bus means it's driverless. Okay, this car, this bus drives on its own. Okay, it was a project, it was a pilot project put together by NTU and LTA. Eventually, they invited Volvo Corporation to be part of this project. Um, this project is off to a rocky start. Okay, although it was actually on pilot test within NTU's campus, it started for about six months. And then the government decided to put it on hold because um, last year there was an increased number of accidents that's coming from autonomous uh, vehicles. So they, they put it on hold for a while. And then recently they restarted this again. So this autonomous bus, okay, it did not come from me and you. It was from the labs of NTU. It was with discussion, okay, after months of discussion with LTA. Okay, so eventually they decided to bring this out, okay, let NTU students and faculty to try it out. Okay, to see whether it works before they roll out in terms of a bigger basis on a bigger basis okay so i've come to almost the end okay of my um actually presentation okay so far I, I guess there's a fair bit of ideas that you have been through uh, but i don't want to make it all about me it's not about me talking and that's not the purpose why you should be attending a webinar i want i would like to see some of you applying the business models and can I trouble some of you to start unmuting your microphones? Okay, I still see a number of you that's uh, muting your mic microphones, but it's fine, no worries. Okay, I would like, okay, all of you, okay, whoever who, who's a bit more participative, okay, I have a small little exercise here. Okay, something that I use in class or something that I use in workshops. Um, the idea of you going for webinars or learning sessions is to be able to apply. Otherwise, it fits the purpose. You may as well sit at home, watch a Netflix series. I would like you to use this tool and annotate. Okay, some of you. Okay, there are a total of six boxes here. All right, I want you to write a number in the second box. Okay, on each row. Okay, so if you think that Zoom uses one business model, you type one. If you think business models two, you type two. Okay, and um, try to use different colors if possible. Okay, so what are they? So what are some of the business models that they use? Okay, say for example, I've taught you about freemium. I've taught you about long tail. Okay, um, I would like some of you to have a goal. Okay, obviously there are 30 of you. Not, not everyone can complete everything. But for those who want to have a bit of hands-on, this will be a good chance okay, for you to put your thinking caps okay, and apply. And obviously, I will also be here to correct you, okay, to tell you a bit more exactly how many business models there are. Okay, can I give you five minutes? Okay, um, use this tool, right? You can either write or you can type. Okay, so once you see someone who's starting on the first box, okay, please go on to other boxes. I would like to see all six boxes being filled up. Thank you. I'll give you five minutes. Nobody is starting on Alibaba and Grab. Okay, okay, maybe I, I, I will help to, to, to actually to give you a better idea of how to use the tools, okay? So for example, rather than you using freehand, you can type, okay? You can type whatever you want and then just hit the enter button. Okay, for those who are not sure, it's all right to make an a informed guess. Okay, hold on, I think it's getting a bit out of hand. Um, I think some of you are not very familiar. Okay. okay, is it all right if I were to erase everything and you guys start again? So let me repeat, 
for those people who have started on one box, please move on to other boxes. Please type, okay? Because sometimes when you use freehand to draw, it's quite difficult okay, for me to decipher. Interesting, some of you are actually indicating their stuff as three business models. Okay, anyone who wants to have a try at Ritmark? Um, so for all of you who are not too sure who's Ritmark, Ritmark is actually an online grocery provider. Okay, that's owned by Alibaba. Okay, hold on, hold on, for this box, okay. So can I trouble the person who writes Starhub, okay, to indicate the business models that they are using? Okay, you have two minutes left before I reveal the answer. Okay, and later as we are going through, um, I may just ask some of you, okay, for opinions or explanation, okay, why there seems to be two business models or three business models to start with. Okay, can the person who has written three for Grab complete the last box? Okay, all right, okay, good attempt. Uh, I see uh, multiple repeat of answers, <laughs> okay. All right, let's, let's actually try, um, okay, I, I would like all of you to unmute your mics, okay, uh, and especially if you do have a question, okay, you can ask along the way. That will be easier for me to, to exchange some ideas with you. Okay, first let's look at Zoom, okay. Zoom, um, according to some of you, okay, there are two business models here. So which are the two business models? Um, first, they are multi-sided. Okay, I did mention that during the presentation. They are also adopting the long tail. Okay, so that's really two business models. Okay, so the right answer to Zoom will be multi-sided and long tail. Okay, um, someone, you guys forgot there's such a thing called Outside. In. So who are the people who are outside? It will be the movie producers. It will be the production houses. So actually Zoom itself, sometimes when you were to look at um, the correlation, right? Okay, there's developers in the background. Okay, there's creating a lot of um, actually wonderful things. For example, people who are giving you the virtual backgrounds. Okay, these are creative agencies. Okay, design houses. So they are actually using something that's outside in, okay, where they depend on developers to give you the virtual backgrounds. 
So Zoom uses three business models. Okay, Netflix. Can someone tell me uh, Netflix? Okay, here it mentions two business model. Which are the two? Anyone? So apparently, um, I, I don't like to do this, but um, in classes, usually I have two. Can I trouble Albert? Albert, uh, yep. Albert, are you there? Hi, hi, I'm here, but the line is breaking a little bit currently. Okay. Can, I, can you repeat the question again? Okay, I would like you to mention, to elaborate a bit more. Okay, for Netflix, okay, someone wrote two business models. Hmm. So Netflix, what are two business models that they adopt? Uh, one of these is definitely the multi-sided. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, uh, the other one is a long tail that you mentioned just now. Yes, mm -hmm. there's something else that's missing. Netflix has three business models assembled into the same organization. No. Outside in. Okay. Yeah. You see all these production uh, houses, okay. Uh, for example, you are Disney, okay. All these production houses, Pixel, they all actually put their movies, right? Through Netflix. Mm. Okay. So, do you think they earn money or do will they have to pay Netflix? They produce the contents, right? Mm. Okay, so by virtue, because these contents are already available, but they have to go through Netflix as a mechanism. Netflix is just a platform. They don't produce their own shows. Okay, although now, nowadays they started to produce their own, but how Netflix got started was because they were just using all these uh, available firms and shows. Mm. Put it on their platform, they digitize it. Okay, mm. as time goes, goes uh, longer, they started to do their own production. Okay, but the origin of Netflix has nothing to do with their own production. So mm. Netflix uses three business models for a start. Mm. Okay. Uh, mm. Let's move on. Thanks a lot, Albert. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, can I invite one of the ladies? Uh, how about Belinda? Belinda, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, Belinda, can you just have a try to share with me a bit more about StartHub? I think um, outside in as well because of all those phones, for example, Apple, Samsung. Mm -hmm. So all this um, actually technology gadgets were, were not from StarHub, right? No. So they use some of these products, some of these ideas that brought it into actually the telcos, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's fine. What else? Um, multi-sided and long tail as indicated. Multi-sided, interesting, you okay. mentioned multi-sided. So why yeah. are they multi-sided? I think it partners with, uh, just now you mentioned it partners with Singtel to build the 5G as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that is actually um, M1. They partner with M1. Oh, okay. Yeah. And long okay. tail is the, yeah, sorry. Long tail is because they have, they are selling other products as well. So what do they sell besides phones? Like, um, other services as well as handphone accessories. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. Anything else you can think of? No. Are they a bundled corporation? Yes. They are also a bundled corporation. Mm -hmm. So for, for StarHub, okay, or any of the telcos, it's not as easy to see them as just a telco. They have mm -hmm. actually bundled four business models into one. Mm -hmm. Okay. First, they use open business. Second, they use multi-sided. Third, they use long tail. Fourth, they use unbundled. Unbundled, okay. Okay, so there are four business models in StarHub. How about Redmart? Okay, um, can I trouble... Let's see. Um, let's see who is available. Uh, Lindsay, are you there? Yes. Okay, Lindsay. Can you do me a can you do me a favor? Can you can you help me to elaborate a bit more about Redmart? Redmart, uh, yeah, it's online, right? Um, I think, uh, yeah, it's long tail because uh, there are many products. Mm -hmm. uh, some of which might be the um, the the thing that uh, make a lot of money for them. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's online. It could be multi sided. Has 
Uh, it can earn kind of advert advertising. Yeah. Kind of mm -hmm. FC, right? Yeah. Yes. That's right. So they have multi sided yeah. they have long tail. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Anything else that you can see? I just jump on YouTube. Anything else? Yeah. Okay. okay. Webmart has only two. Okay, you're, you're spot yeah. on. Webmart has only two business models. Okay, stack on top of each another. Okay, can I trouble William? William, are you there? Uh, William Toh. Okay, William may not be there. Okay, any volunteers for Alibaba? Okay, that's something that that, um, I, that I, I always not comfortable when I'm presenting to an Asian. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Can I add oh, a little? Sure. Ali, yeah, Alibaba is, I think, multi sided, yes, outside in, because mm -hmm. it's kind so, of B2B, right? Okay. Um, they invite other business to, they are kind of middlemen, right? Uh -huh. uh, from what I understand. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. And and outside also in. Inside out. They are not yeah, outside in, yeah, they are also yeah, inside yeah, out. They have their own product as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What else? Yeah. Alibaba Corporation itself okay, has an unbundled business. They don't just serve okay, one customer group. True? They, they serve consumers okay, like you and me who decide to buy items off their platform. They serve businesses okay, by providing Alipay. Uh, some of you know what's Alipay, right? Most of you, I guess, you know what's Alipay. Okay, so that's actually an online um credit payment system. It's an app-based credit payment system. Okay, um, and it, and they also have long queue, right? Okay, so in Alibaba itself, you can see four business models into one. First, they have unbundled. Second, they have long tail. Third. They are multi-sided. Fourth, they are open business innovation. Okay, so there's four for Alibaba. Grab, how many do we have? Um, any volunteers for Grab? Something that you are probably using quite regularly. Anyone for Grab? Okay, let me see who's there. Um, Lena, are you there? Lena or Jeffrey, are you there? Okay, can I have a volunteer to? Yeah, I think the Grab is anyone. Yeah. yeah, Grab. I think is um outside outside in, multi sided. Mm -hmm. Um. Also, uh, what's the thing? Unbundled? Unbundled, yeah. Okay, so yeah, do they have long, long tail? Do they have long tail? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, right, because they, they use other products. Okay, grab food uses long tail. They work with yep. a lot of restaurants, right? To give you all the cuisine choices possible. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So Grab Food uses long tail, one of the most successful business models around. Okay, through this small little exercise, you realize that the more successful the business is, okay, the higher the number of business models they stack on top of each another. Okay. They are no longer your simple businesses where, oh, okay, I, I know my customers well. Let me go to market with just one model. These businesses are not as naive, okay? They will spend a lot of time to think about how to make their business models complex so that nobody can replicate their business models easily. So we have been talking about competitive advantage. We have been talking about strategies, okay? In all these organizations, the people who are in the organizations, they spend a lot of time thinking about how business model innovation applies to their industries. And to make a very successful business or a very, very successful entrant okay, to a new market, in today's context, you just need okay, to spend a lot more. You can just not go into market with just one single product. 
or one single offering. Okay, it's too shallow and too simplistic. So moving forward, all these organizations will still continue to innovate, to evolve, to change. Okay, and I will see that in a long way to come. Right? Okay, let me just close off the contents. Thanks a lot for all your sharing. Okay, I guess everybody has a very good try at this. Okay, moving forward. Okay, I've come to the end of my presentation. Later, I'm going to open the, the room for discussion okay, for any questions that you have. Okay, I have two other upcoming series. One is Innovation, Relevance, and Application. Okay, that's happening next Friday. Okay, and another one, which is the third and final series, okay, happening two weeks from now on the 14th. Okay, next week is Innovation Webinar Series. We are going to look at strategies. We're going to look at techniques. Today, we have only looked at business model. We have not really gone deep down to design okay, something that's appealing, something that is extremely successful. So next week, we are going to walk away from business model. We are going to examine all the possibilities okay, or all the mechanisms, right? all the tools that successful businesses use today. So, and how it applies to you on a day-to-day basis, right? So, that will be for next week. In the final week, on the 14th of May, we will be looking at disruptive innovation. That means we are talking about dissecting the whole business model, reconstructing. So, there's a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of brainstorming. But it's something for people to walk away with today, especially if you're intending to start a new business, okay? Finally, this series is made possible, okay? Uh, thanks to my colleagues, okay, where we actually put together a graduate diploma in digital transformation. So the class is starting on the 12th. And if you're someone who likes to keep updated with new business models, with different ways to contest conventional businesses, that will be a program that you can think about. Okay. And finally, because of the bigger gameplay, strategy itself and innovation, they go hand in hand. It's found in one of our MBA programs. They're starting on the 11th of July. So if you want to have something that's very lighthearted, okay, something that's applicable based, but you have limited time, my suggestion is go for my webinar series. Try not to miss any one of them because all that are interrelated in a way. Okay, for people who want a more structured approach, okay, people who want to know the, the books and nuts of everything, you will have to go for either graduate diploma or the MBA series. Okay, with that, I'll move on to my final sharing session. Questions, anyone? Okay, it can be any part of the, the presentation I have. Uh, and the main idea is just to open up the floor to let you all know, uh, to share with you a bit more about what has been happening in the business community today. Any questions? Anyone? Um, are you still there? <laughs> I know I'm, I'm getting close to lunch time. Okay, and I hope all of you have learned something today. If no questions, um, please feel free to touch base with us. We look forward to seeing you next Friday, okay, where I will share a lot more about other aspects okay, of the program. Right? Thank you, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Right? Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. I'll see you again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you. Thanks for attending. Super, super, super awesome. Stanley. Yes. There's a question from Jeffrey in the chat. Uh, yeah. Not clear about unbundling business model. Okay. Um, Jeffrey, to answer your question, if you go back to if you go back to the slide okay let me just share my screen again okay you can see this slide about unbundled business model right okay let me go back to pattern one yeah okay so what was your question on jeffrey Hi, uh, yeah. Can you hear me, Stanley? Yes, yes, Jeffrey. I don't sure. understand what does it mean. Uh, what do you mean by unbundling business model? Okay, unbundled means from the start, okay, at the beginning, 
okay, you'll find that this, this achieve business model is very complex, okay? There's a lot of hidden, okay, sub-business models within the general business model. In other words, okay, there are many very, very different value propositions, okay? And each of these businesses are very different from one another, okay? But they all happen to be found in the same corporation. So you see this in a lot of diversified businesses. For example, all these MNCs that you see where they serve more than just one market or they are in more than one business. For example, uh, General Motors, GM, okay, GE, General Electric. Okay, they are not just in actually electronics products. They are also in finance, okay, they're in construction, so on and so forth. So in this type of organization, they are humongous. Okay, and for you to make sense of their business model, you will have to dissect each of these businesses one by one. Okay, to know exactly how many different types of sub-business models they have. Mm. Okay. okay, usually it applies to organizations where they're either publicly listed or they are really huge. Okay, uh, and they have multinational um, operations around different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, and, and to look at that, okay, you have to use a lot in terms of the business model. First, you look at one, one subsidiary. Okay, after that, once you're done with one subsidiary, you move on to the next subsidiary. Mm. So in a amended business model, especially the bigger the organization, right? The bigger this actually business model uh, diagram will have to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's a mm. huge collection. So here I've only shown three types. Mm. In a lot of listed companies, they have more than 10 or even 15. Mm. Okay. So the okay. purpose of the the purpose of the business model is just give you a bird's eye view. Mm. Okay. All right. So I hope that gives you an overview about okay. the application. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Okay. It's, it's, it's very broad. Lah. I mean, this, this uh, particular model is huge. Uh, and they normally, in the amended business model, right, they started with one. It's, they started with a very simple business model, mm. just one. But over time, they started building. They started encroaching into other areas, and it steps one on top of another. So it's like a multi-layer. Right. Okay? But it's not multi-sided, right? it's multi-layered. Okay? If I were to use another word, this is multi-layered business model. Okay. All yeah. right. Right. Okay, any other questions from yeah, the rest? Thanks. Anyone with other questions? Okay, let me just take a look at the... Okay, I guess um, most of you won't have any more questions. And so I'll end my session today. Uh, hopefully, I'll see you next week. Okay, on Friday, and together we will explore a lot more about the tools and the techniques, the strategies that we can apply to come up with a totally different business model. With that, thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch and stay safe and stay healthy. All right, I'll see you around. See you next Friday. Bye.